Hey guys, I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. You know, despite the revelations concerning the scope of NSA's spying, there's been little political action to reform the shady practices of the secretive agency. But earlier this week, a small group of politicians introduced a bill to challenge the NSA's lack of oversight. The charge, led by Senator Ron Wyden, proposes an overhaul of the agency and a ban of the bulk collection of Americans' phone and email records. But it's not just about gathering data. The bill would also introduce a constitutional advocate to argue on behalf of the civil liberties community at the FISA court. Now, of course, there's strong opposition to the legislation, mainly from Dianne Feinstein, who chairs the Intelligence Committee. Yeah, Feinstein seems to just like the NSA just the way it is, and it's all encompassing glory. So if you care about your privacy, too, and want to see this bill pass, then join me, and let's break the set. Mistake, and we're working very hard to make up for it. And once again, to put something on the air, it's a flat out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, it's do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. Yesterday, I aired my interview with Robert McChesney, communications professor and author of the book Dollarocracy, about the money and media elections complex and how it profits off the erosion of democracy. But I also had the chance to talk to him about his other book, Digital Disconnect, which explores the effect technology has on our lives and the relationship between capitalism and public participation. In it, he talks about the initial development of a neutral internet and how drastically it's changed since its inception. I asked him how this evolution occurred and why it's so destructive to the principles of a democracy. One of the striking features of the internet is that it's really a testament to public policy, uh, to public sector spending, even a testament to socialism, if you will. I mean, for decades, the internet was created, spawned, and developed by basic research and support exclusively paid for by the U.S. government, both through the military on one hand and through our leading public research institutions and nonprofit research institutions funded by federal dollars. Uh, in fact, the story goes that in the early 1970s, the government tried to turn over the predecessor to the Internet to AT&T, then the phone monopoly, and AT&T studied it and said, look, we don't want it. We can't make any profits off this. We don't see an end game here, a killer app that'll make it profitable. So the government kept it again for another 20 years. Even by the early 1990s, when the World Wide Web came along and began the process of popularizing the Internet, uh, some Mark Andreessen said, you know, at that time, the founder of Netscape, uh, he came up in the culture that developed the Internet and the World Wide Web. He said the Internet was militantly egalitarian and exceptionally hostile to anything commercial. Militantly egalitarian. It was, and I was there. That was completely the culture. The idea was that the Internet was going to be a place where the hucksters, the salesmen, the con artists were not invited. Everywhere else in American society, you could marinate yourself in advertising, commercialism, and the market. This was going to be where everyone's equal. It's a public sphere, and it's going to be non-commercial, non-profit. That was the whole founding principle. That's what got some people so excited about it. And what was striking is during the course of the 1990s, it did a 180-degree turn. It was flipped on its head. So it became the center of the new economy. Vast fortunes were being created. And our news media could barely contain themselves cheering on the new gazillionaires who were being created. You know, I think that the main dysfunction of the system in which we live is the deterioration of the fourth estate, of course. And I know that you're very passionate about investigative journalism as well. You've said that there's never been a solvent market for journalism and that it's mostly been opportunistic for a long time. So how can we create, sustain, and ensure a healthy media that's independent from these corporate interests, Robert? Well, my, my argument, and I think the evidence backs up pretty strongly, I've been researching it for 25 years, is that journalism is the public good. It's something society desperately needs, but the market can't produce in sufficient quality or quantity. Now, for the last 125 years, that public good nature of journalism was masked in the United States and in other countries, because advertising provided between 50 and 100% of the revenues to support journalism. 
uh, even though advertising had no particular interest in journalism. It did so opportunistically. Well, now we're in the era of smart advertising as we go digital. And advertising no longer has to support journalism or any sort of content production. When an advertiser goes online, goes digital, they no longer buy ads on mediums and then have to pay the medium, the website, uh, to have access to the website's traffic. Instead, they go through one of the great uh, advertising networks like Google or Microsoft or AOL or Yahoo, and they place an ad basically say we want 30 million women, 29 to 34, who are interested in our product. And they'll find those 30 million women in real time right away at whatever websites they go to. And we now know, thanks to the NSA scandal, that these companies know everywhere we go online. So they can find us. They no longer have to pay off a website to get us. What this means is journalism is sort of standing naked now in the breeze and it no longer has the revenues to be solvent commercially. And here, what I argue, and I think the evidence is pretty strong, there's a great tradition in American history. What did we do before we had uh, advertising grow by the end of the 19th and early 20th century to support journalism? We still had the greatest press system in the world. The reason we did is we had massive federal subsidies of journalism. We had a postal subsidy, which basically made the distribution of newspapers virtually free for the 19th century. It took it wiped the whole cost off the balance books for all uh, publishers. We also have massive printing subsidies that kept alive dissident newspapers and numerous newspapers uh, all over the country. The State Department subsidized newspapers in, in every state uh, through most of the 19th century, and it gave us this vibrant press. I think what we need today is we need to have uh, public investments to create an independent, nonprofit, non-commercial, competitive press with the resources to do the job. I've studied it. You know, I wish the commercial guys luck, but I could, the evidence is in. They're not going to make it. If they, some of them make it serving the wealthy, more power to them. But for the rest of us, those of us who need journalism, if we're going to have a free society and a self-governing society, we're going to need something better. And I think it's going to require enlightened public policies, much like we see taking place in the best democracies in the world, according to The Economist magazine, places like Norway, Germany, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, uh, even Great Britain. Uh, all of which makes substantial investments in independent journalism. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. Robert McChesney, professor of communications and author of Dollarocracy and Digital Disconnect. A pleasure to have you on. My great pleasure. We're living in a time where social media has created a platform where anyone can become a journalist. And it raises an interesting point. Should everyone practicing journalism receive the same federal protections when faced with having revealed their sources? Well, this is exactly the question answered by a Senate committee earlier this month after passing the Free Flow of Information Act. The bill, also referred to as the Media Shield Law, has not yet moved into the House or Senate for debate, but its broad definition of what a journalist is has already raised concerns. Join me now to help me break down what this bill is all about. I'm joined by Zoe Carpenter, reporter for The Nation. Thank you so much for coming on, Zoe. Nice to be here. Thank you. So you've written um, about how this bill actually offers almost no protections for national security um, correspondents or reporters, rather. Can you explain why? Sure. So the bill is designed to protect journalists from having to testify against their sources. And, however, there's a significant carve-out for national security cases, so the government can persuade a judge that the information they're seeking would be useful to mitigate a significant and articulable threat to national security, the journalists won't be protected. And the language that's in the Senate's version is very broad, and there's a lot of wiggle room, and it would really depend on a judge's interpretation. So it leaves national security reporters at the mercy of interpretation there. And let's talk about kind of that broad criteria, because I think a lot of people don't really understand what it is when you're, when you're talking about this. What exactly is their definition of, of a journalist? So in the Senate version, they refer to a covered person, and a covered person is someone who's worked for one continuous year in the past 20, or they've worked for three consecutive months in the past five years, or they've contributed a significant body of work, or they're a student journalist. There is an important exception that allows judges to use their discretion to apply the protections to someone who doesn't meet those definitions in the interest of justice. Um, but it is really linking the business of journalism with that definition of journalist. And so it puts more emphasis on being a professional or a traditional journalist. I was just going to ask, how do they define kind of a reputable news source? Does it have to be one that's registered as a corporation or, or a nonprofit? Or I mean, it just seems like that's even questionable. That is questionable. And again, that's up to interpretation. I think um, most media advocates do think that this law would cover most serious bloggers, um, people who are just starting out in their career and don't have that history 
history, the track record to back them up, the, the gray area is larger for them. And that's the danger, obviously. Um, right. You know, let's talk about James Risen because he has a really interesting case, um, kind of feeds into this whole bill. Talk about his case and, and if he would be protected under the law in its current form. So James Risen was a New York Times reporter who was asked to testify against um, an alleged source, a former CIA official who um, reportedly leaked information to him. Um, and he has refused to testify and the government has come after him again and again, and uh, it's not clear whether he would be covered by the Senate's version because the the information that the government is interested in is national security related, and so it would really be up to the government to argue that uh, it was threatening to national security. And so Ryzen would certainly be at risk under this law still, and even if he weren't ultimately convicted, it could still be damaging to his reputation, and it would make sources less likely to work with him in the future, potentially. So it's just, it's a scare tactic. Regardless of what the actual outcome in court is, it still um, makes room for intimidation. Absolutely. I think the chilling effect is what's really at stake here. Um, a lot of people not willing to come out and talk about or do journalism rather. And I know that this bill was actually a compromise in itself based on the previous language of the bill. If this passes through um, the House and the Senate, what precedent do you think it will set and really just expand on the chilling effect that it could have for national security responders in the future? I think the chilling effect is really on the whistleblowers themselves because that's what these leak investigations are targeting, right? They're, they're going through journalists to get at the people who are leaking information. So I think that the job of national security reporters is already very difficult. There's already a chilling effect because of these um, prosecutions and the, the aggressive tactics that the administration is using. Uh, and, and we do, things are already bad. We do need a media shield law. I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, but I think that there certainly would be more of a chilling and whistleblowers would be less likely to come forward, certainly. And of course, we've seen uh, eight people charged in the Espionage Act. I mean, there's a, there's a full on war against whistleblowers happening right now in this country. Um, you know, let's talk about WikiLeaks because one really interesting facet of the bill is that it intentionally excludes organizations like WikiLeaks, which is obviously that, that organization that can provide the form for whistleblowers to tell stories or release information. Why do you think these legislators don't consider something like that uh, part of a journalistic entity? Well, so the WikiLeaks exemption, as they're calling it, is um, it doesn't cover journalists working for organizations that just produce bulk raw materials, basically. They aren't synthesizing it into, quote unquote, original works. Um, and I think the government sees WikiLeaks as a serious threat because uh, it's completely outside this established traditional journalism um, organization structure that they, that they know about and have contacts with. So when the New York Times or the Washington Post wants to publish a story that has serious implications for national security, they may approach the government first and talk about some of the risks. And the government doesn't have that kind of um, oversight or at least dialogue with organizations like WikiLeaks. And what would an ideal media sh shield law look like if we could have our way? Sure. <laughs> so the House's version is actually much stronger at this point. Now, keep in mind, it hasn't been marked up yet. So we should expect that um, there may be attempts to weaken it. It doesn't have um, such a large national security carve out. And so I think, although the White House will insist on some kind of national security exception, we would want to see something very specific. So um, in only information that would prevent terrorist attacks or prevent the harm of service members overseas, that kind of specific threat language we would want to be in there. Also, it would make more sense to define the act of journalism and cover anyone who is engaged in the act of journalism rather than trying to define what a covered person or define what a journalist is. Because journalism now, it's no longer an institution, it's really a function. Um, and so having a media shield law that really reflects the new ecosystem of, of media would be a, a good idea. I love that. I love that redefining, yeah, just c completely shedding that label and really the act of journalism. It's almost just, you know, it's a crime in itself. It's becoming one. And I wanted to ask, you know, we were talking about the war on whistleblowers. Do you think that this, this if it does pass, will curb that, uh, will curb this persecution that we're seeing and will kind of send a message to Obama saying, hey, you know, we're trying to do this independently to try to kind of send a message to stop this? I think there has been a pretty strong backlash to this war on whistleblowers. Um, but whether that actually plays out in policy remains to be seen. And, and there will be a lot of legal wrangling no matter how this comes down because judges' interpretation will play a role no matter how the final language is written. Right. I'm sure that we'll see cases kind of being brought to court after this bill does pass and kind of um, contesting a lot of facets of it. Thank you so much. Zoe Carpenter from Thank The Nation. You. Appreciate your time.
sit tight. The Siren will join us after the break to break the stage. Spice, K2, Scooby Snacks. The insulting thing is that they actually have the nerve to call it potpourri. You're smoking chemicals. You're smoking something that is laced with you don't even know what. There's many, many different compounds that make up this class of synthetic drugs. There's no real use for any of these substances. There's no FDA regulations on synthetic marijuana. You might as well just be smoking lighter fluid. You have no idea what is in that. I know CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News have taken some knocks lately, but the fact is I admire their commitment to cover all sides of a story, just in case one of them happens to be accurate. <laughs> that was funny, but it's closer to the truth than you might think. <laughs> <laughs> because when politicians and the mainstream media work side by side, <laughs> the joke is actually on you. <laughs> At RT News, we have a different approach. L O L. Because the news of the world just is not this funny. I'm not laughing, damn it, I'm not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you guys stick to the jokes, we'll handle the news. <laughs> As you know, I like to feature up-and-coming artists from all genres on the show, give them a platform to share their message. Casey Barrick, better known as the Siren on stage, is a self-titled audio frequency scientist. He calls his style of music Epic Step, which is a fusion of metal, chord, dubstep, and electro. He's also a visual artist who edits and produces all of his own music videos. His lyrics combine radical activism with philosophy and touch on everything from science to politics, all with a fierce beat. So here's Siren performing social control. Right now, the government is using hidden cameras in cities across the country to watch you around the clock. Your everyday travels are being recorded and years of your activities are being stored in a colossal data storage center that can be mined to find out where you've been, where you're going, and just exactly what you've been doing. The Fourth Amendment says that we need probable cause for the government to be spying on us. That in this day and age, these rights are regularly violated. This is a technology of social control. And at what privacy costs? Well, according to the government, there is no expectation of privacy in public anymore. And they can pretty much do anything that they want. I guess the real question here is what else is going on that we don't know about? These government agencies have an insatiable urge to use surveillance technology to eventually track and record everyone on the planet. And they simply won't stop until they have. Guns in the sky, retaliate till I die. Hurricane flowing through my blood from the media's lies. Disconnected from society, there is no dividing me. I'm dying from the pain while the system is trying me. Dirty politician, criminals are taking the cake. The global list is in my scope, so now I'm raising the stakes. How much your legacy is worth when you lie in the chalk? I'm a protesting, yeah. Where's my sign? It's a Glock. Go ahead, arrest me again. Associate me with sin, associate me as a threat, you don't know where I've been, I'm as strong as can be, cause I was forged on the block, especially mentally, my truth is solid as rock, and we predicted it all, and we predicted the fall, and when the system collapsed, the corporations will crawl, you better plan to demise, and wait the dirt from your eyes, open yourself to the truth, the government's all the lies.
straight out the rust belt. I'm reppin' 330. You're gonna need lemon fresh. Our hands get real dirty. Villains on your screen. Fireable local fiends. I'm checking, I'm sweating to make you see what I have seen. Tyrannical machine versus mankind. We're going 12 rounds. A war for your mind. The siren resistance will make it all be understood. These sheep will everywhere. We turn them into wolves. In this game of chess, I am a knight, you're just a pawn. I'm like an innovator, James Cameron. My verses flow like you're swimming in the Amazon. You criminals like the employees of Enron. Taking money, stealing lives like they John Gotti. You crooked bankers are the virus killing everybody. Now step back, wise enough to see that true agenda. 21, here it comes, poverty will get ya. You call yourself an audio frequency scientist. What is that? Right. Uh, so basically, I'm trying to take different types of sounds and frequencies and circuit bending and things like that and, you know, uh, modulate them in certain ways so that it makes patterns and different notes. And basically, you know, when, when a scientist likes to go out and find new things in the world and, and try to manipulate those in different ways to better things. So I figured, you know, I guess that's what I'm trying to do with uh, the music, what I'm, what I'm working with, you know. So anything I can think of, you know, I just want to take it to different levels. So awesome. that's why. And Chaz, uh, I know politics can turn people off from a lot of music. Why do you feel like it's important to incorporate political message with music? Well, I mean, we're trying to just create things that have like substance to it, you know. It's like there's so much, so much uh, things like in the music industry, people, you know, rapping about just nothing and just things without substance. And we're trying to just bring like a new light, you know, to the table, you know, just um, tell people that you know there's more to life than just you know excess and partying. There's there's a whole other, a whole other world going on out there that people have, don't even know about or choose not to, choose not to know about. And we're just trying to bring this information to the table, you know. Um, whether it be through music or, or any kind of other kind of social media or things like that. So. And there's a lot of raw, energetic uh, passion, and you can hear it in the music, and that's what I love so much. It's very visceral because that's real, that's mm -hmm. reality, and that is what's going on. Casey, okay, so let's talk about Social Control, the song um, that you just performed, featuring a lot of images from this show, which is really awesome, and a lot of amazing protest footage from all over the world. How do you think society is being controlled? So it's, it's unfortunate that. Um, there's a conglomerate of elite people that own the media corp the main media corporations and also the water companies and you know they all this stuff it's it's all the same it's all the same people that have their, their hands in everything and, and they're treating the world like uh, a bunch of NFL teams and they're just pitting them against each other even though they're behind it all you know and for this or for that and um, it's almost like a soap opera and you know we're all sick of it you know and we just want to live in peace and harmony and you know have free energy systems and you know end this this oil business and everything that we're in and you know we've we've just we've evolved now as as humans so we're past all this but they're keeping us trapped in it for their for their gain you know well as Peter Joseph calls it the worst reality show in the world <laughs> and and Chaz you know that's where I met you guys I met you guys when you performed at the Zeitgeist Media Festival it was really awesome to be a part of that with you guys what made you want to be part of that event 
Well, it's, it's, there's so many like-minded individuals like ourselves, you know, it's just kindred spirits. Um, we went to the first one back in 2011, uh, just, just checking it out, and like, oh my gosh, this is awesome, we gotta be a part of this. And so, um, it was like earlier this year when uh, I knew that they were, it was, gonna, it was gonna be coming up, and I suggested to Casey, you know, like, dude, we need to get on this, you need to submit for this. And it's like, yeah, and so, they, it took a while for them to get back to us, because, you know, they had a lot of stuff going on, but, uh, but, but you know, they said that they really dug what we did, and. Uh, yeah, and it was the rest of history, I guess. And, it you know. was an absolutely epic experience, epic performance that you guys did there, really powerful. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Casey, where can people find out more about The Siren? Um, what is thesiren.com? And we're using our funding from the music industry to create uh, free energy systems and amps that, that I'm working on because I, I went to school for electronic energy engineering. Reinventing the wheel, thank you so much. Casey, Chaz, you guys rock. You, you rock. You rock. If you like what you see, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash breaking the set. Be sure to subscribe while you're there so you don't miss a single episode we do. We also have every single segment and every single interview we've ever done on the show posted separately under the videos tab. I encourage everyone to check out the first part of my interview with Robert McChesney, focusing on Citizens United and why we need to remove money from politics. Check out all that and more at youtube.com slash breaking the set you guys the channel design has changed so everyone check it out because it's really confusing to navigate you got to go to that videos tab and check out all the playlists that's a wrap for us tonight and this week have a great weekend you guys we'll see you right back here on monday to break the set all over again